Do not be alarmed. We have taken control of your radio to bring you a message for all mankind. Looking for better value house insurance? High House Insurance don't pay to be on comparison websites, so your premiums are better value. Try us and see. For a free, no obligation quote, call 606 552. High House, local, reliable insurance. High Street, Selsey. That's us here at Selsey Internet Radio, we're the station that cares. Yes, welcome once again to Selsey Internet Radio's podcast. My name's Keith Barnes, and in the programme this week, we have What's On, which is our weekly look at what's going on in and around the village for the coming week. We have a couple of recipes from Keithy's Kitchen. We talk to Jean Hamilton from the Fibromyalgia Group. And we also have a short story from Ellis Berg. And throw that together with some music and weather, and that's the programme for this week. Now, this is just a sample of some of the things that are going on in and around the village for the coming week for your education and uh, enjoyment. Right, Tuesday and Wednesday evenings at the Fisherman's Joy, they host the Ace Poker League. Now, for just a £1 admin fee, you can play No Limit Texas Hold'em Poker and you can build up your points towards a grand final where there are some significant cash prizes up for grabs. It's a great evening's entertainment and fantastic value for a quid. And on both evenings, they start at about 7.30. Now, on Wednesday evening at the Seal, we've got Quizmaster Malcolm's famous pub quiz. Now, this starts at 8.30 and there's a cash prize and there's free drinks to be won as well, so it's always a bonus. And if you want to make a full evening of this, well, why not book a table for dinner before the quiz starts? So you'll have a full evening's entertainment and a full stomach as well. Wonderful. On Thursday the 5th at the library... There's a book break meeting. This is running from 10.30 to 11.30 and you can go along there and have a cup of tea or a coffee and a chat with fellow book lovers and view the new books that have arrived and possibly discover a new author that you haven't tried before and you can chat to each other about what you think of different books. And that's at the library, 10.30 to 11.30 on Thursday the 5th. On Friday the 6th, the Derby and Joan Club have their meeting at uh, St Peter's Church Hall, and that's between 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock, so if you'd like to go along there, you can have a game of bingo and a cup of tea, and you'll be most welcome. Now, on Saturday the 7th, the first Selsey Scout Group's charity shop at the Scouts HQ in School Lane will be open from 10 till 12 noon, and they'll be selling bric-a-brac, books, clothes, etc. Now, all donations will be gratefully received, um, they're going to be saleable goods, of course, but it's no good dumping all your rubbish there, which is what quite often happens, unfortunately, with different charities. Um, quality goods always welcome. Deliver to the shop on Saturday morning if you can, but if you can't, then phone Deb's Clothier, the group scout leader, on 01243 607 409, and she'll arrange collection. Which brings us to Sunday the 8th, and live music at the seal. Well... If you're on a while away a couple of hours on a Sunday afternoon with some good beer and listening to some good music, you couldn't go far wrong with this. There's a four-piece band on on Sunday the 8th and they're called Can't Help Bad Luck and they play a mixture of classic rock, blues rock, R&B from the 60s and 70s and 80s. So I remember most of them, certainly. And this kicks off at uh, 3 o'clock. So get yourself down to the seal, cut the nice pints, sit back and listen to the music. Brilliant way to spend a Sunday afternoon. And on Monday the 9th, it's time for the Cinema Club. And from 7.30pm, they'll be screening The Age of Adeline. Now, Adeline, played by Blake Lively, is 107 years old, but she's not aged a day since a freak accident when she was 29 years old. Her daughter now looks old enough to be a grandmother, and after a life of hiding her secret and constantly changing her identity, Adeline is alone. Everything changes after a chance meeting leads to a weekend where she comes face to face with, with an old flame. Now this is well written and beautifully acted, particularly by Harrison Ford as the old love, and this film rises above fantasy to give surprising depth and emotion. So there you are. Tickets are £5, starts at 730 
place to be on Monday the 9th. I think most of us could relate to this film. I'm sure that many of us look in the mirror and expect to see a 20-odd year old looking back instead of a 60 or 70-odd year old. Um, and if only it were true. And that's about it for this week. As I say, this is just a sample of the things that are going on in and around the village. And if your group or society or whatever would like a mention on what's on, well, please get in touch with us. You can contact us at studio.cellsyinternetradio at gmail.com or you can text us on 07551 and we'll be more than happy to give you a shout out. Now, you may remember in a previous program, I spoke to Teresa White from the local Fibromyalgia Association. I smile because I'm, I'm dread falling over that word every time I say it. Um, and today in the studio, as a follow-up to that interview, we've got Jean Hambleton. And Jean's going to tell us about the effect that Fibromyalgia had on her life. Jean. Oh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, well, it was quite sudden, actually. It really changed my life. I was leading a life at 100 miles an hour. I'd been working for the Chichester Observer in the 70s, 80s and 90s and loved life. And um, really, everything was great. And then all of a sudden, um, I was in local government and I had a very difficult um, problem with councillors who wanted to spend ratepayers' money on things that they shouldn't do. So I became the bad guy. So they managed to stitch me up but I won't go into that in more detail. So then in 2003, um, I was ill. I didn't know what was wrong with me. It took three months before I was really able to get any kind of a diagnosis. Um, and then the diagnosis was fibromyalgia, which was a new word to me. It was fibro what? What's fibromyalgia? Um, so suddenly it changed my life. and. I sat back in a chair, thought I'd never walk again, and then I thought, well, what am I going to do with the rest of my life, sat in a chair? Um, as I'd had a very busy life, and I'm an alcoholic, and I, I thought, well, I'll look into some research, and I might join a group and find out what it's all about, but of course it got the better of me, and I got, being a nosy news reporter, I wanted to know more, I went to the States and went to a, a conference there where, of course, they're way ahead in the USA about research on fibromyalgia. Um, in fact, the states claim it's reaching epidemic proportion. So obviously it went from there and then I started a group and another group and then I went on. And then by 2009, I was feeling a bit bored and I wanted to do more. And I said to my group, why don't we start a conference? Oh, no, no, that's too much. No, we couldn't do that. We couldn't do that. But not to be um, put off, I decided I'd do it myself. And I dragged my poor husband in. And we did our first conference in 2010. We did it locally because obviously I had fibromyalgia and I couldn't travel very far and I wasn't very strong and... So I thought, well, if it's in Chichester, I can get to Chichester and that would be fine. So we did our first conference there and we did it at, the, at Brackelsham Bay at this holiday camp there. Um, I knew the manager quite well and my son was head chef there. So it was all set up. It was fine. The manager was very sympathetic and it was wonderful. We had 375 people at our first conference. It was great. It was a sellout. Uh, we called it a pamper weekend and fibromyalgia so we invited the pet the partners and we did all sorts of things for the partners we did a fossil thing on the beach for them and uh, all sorts of things golf we organized and and so it was a big success um so next year is what we're going to do so come 211 yes we'll do another one by then i was promised some american visitors and it was by somebody else promised was to do it and was dealing with it. Um, but when it came to push about a month before, after I'd advertised that these top speakers from the States were coming to tell us about their research, this particular person said, well, I'm terribly sorry, but they're not coming. So of course I was in terrible trouble. They had, and I had so many bookings and I had to meet a special booking number but of course I couldn't because the speakers weren't coming and so many people wanted their money back. However, we went ahead, I lost money and I decided I wouldn't do it anymore. That was the end of the conference, that was to be in 2011. But at the same time, I was involved with the local charity, which was 
then FMS SAS, which was fibromyalgia, Surrey and Sussex. And the trustees there said, Jean, you can't do this. You can't not do it. We've got to do it. Anyway, they twisted my arm and we did it. But we did it at the local Chichester Park Hotel, which only required 200 people, which we thought that we had a good chance of matching. So from 212, we went onwards and we're now in our seventh. It's um, very good. It's well attended. One delegate said to me, I think it's a life changing experience which was very gratifying. A um, couple of years ago, we had the Norwegian Fibromyalgia Association representative come. She gave us flying marks for organization and the quality of speakers. We've had an American doctor and a UK doctor cooperate in fibromyalgia research across the Atlantic. So we were thrilled to bits about that. And all of this wouldn't have happened without the conference. So quite honestly, this time further on, we do feel that it's got to be a must and we must go on with it. We must keep it going because people do find it so beneficial. So our next one is next April. We meet every April at the Chichester Park Hotel for this th residential four day event. And we offer stage payments to make it easy for people who are on benefits. We can also put them in touch with people who can pay their bill, pay their bill if they're on benefits. So that it all helps. We do everything we can to help fibromyalgia people. Um, and that's really about where we are at the moment. Now, I notice you're also chair of an organisation for research called Folly Pogs Fibromyalgia. Now, who and why is Folly Pogs? Well, Folly Pogs is a bit of a funny story, actually. Um, it, in about 2007, I was working with a lady called Sarah, um, who was a complementary therapy and uh, we decided that we would have um, a ball um, and we would have a um, to begin with actually we called ourselves um, uh, we called ourselves oh my goodness brain fade this is cognitive behavior um, fibromyalgia philanthropist fp fibromyalgia philanthropist we got so many letters people wanting money because we hadn't realized that the philanthropist was giving money and we thought that we were going to collect money so of course we had to change the name so we fiddled about we tossed about and i said well, we've got to stick with fp because that's what we've started with somebody said folly pogs so we said yes let's go with that and of course it's a memorable name people remember it because it's different or they stumble and call us polyflogs, like Fibromyalgia UK does in print. She reverses it. You must have brain fade. Um, and so we're stuck with Follypogs Research. The idea is that we would raise money and do fundraising, and we'll find some fundraisers to do that for us. Um, and um, we put money into research. But um, obviously the natural answer was to have the conference. And the conference, of course, is run by volunteers. Um, three of us run the uh, organize the conference throughout the year and come the actual event we have a team of 10 fibromyalgia who volunteer and they do a lot of the jobs during the weekend and it's a huge success so um, we work under the old pals act 1895 and we beg borrow and quote steal unquote if necessary um, for equipment or anything that we need we borrow trustees from other groups and we borrow equipment or to keep the costs down and then at the end of it all um, every booking um, makes a contribution to fibromyalgia research and also we make a substantial donation of two or three thousand at the end of the uh, conference and that's mainly raised not out of one of the the um, delegates pay but by sales we sell fibromyalgia books we sell fibromyalgia um, t-shirts with folly Pogs research um, emblazoned on it we sell bags all sorts of things anything we can sell to raise money for research that's what we do and very very recently um, I've been invited to write for a magazine called Fibro Flare magazine it's on the website it's online it's a free monthly magazine and they wrote and asked me to write for them and of course I said yes because I knew I was going to write about folly Pogs. And within a month, we were offered a percentage of the funds that they raised towards our research. So we were thrilled to bits about very that. Useful, very useful. Is there um, a website that people can go to to find out about the conference or a phone number that they can contact? 
Certainly, out, there is uh, there is a fibromyalgia conference website. It's www.fibromyalgiaconference.webly.com. Booking forms, details about last conference, details about the next conference. Also, you will find it on the Fibromyalgia South East Org UK. Um, I write on there and there's writing about the last conference, 215, 214, and also how far we've got with the 216. Um, so it's an ongoing thing. It all ticks along quite smoothly. Um, FMS SES, which was the Surrey and Sussex group and is now Fibromyalgia South East, supports all of the groups in the South East of England. We have an annual event. We send them newsletters. We have a website. We keep them in touch with what's happening. We make them offers. We invite them to conference. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, some of them do events, cake bakes and things, and donate money to Folly Polks. And, and the conference, meanwhile, ticks on and makes money for research. And we've actually got our foot on the ladder for research, and we've um, made our first contribution to a research process with a Dr. Kim Lawson, from Sheffield Hallam University and they're doing research um, with fibromyalgia survey um, to find out um, what treatments they have, what drugs they have, what pains they have to try and come up with some kind of definitive answer of what we need to be looking for for a cure because we've been without a cure for thousands and thousands of years because it was widespread pain originally and of course Job in the Bible had widespread pain after his work. And of course, Florence Nightingale, after she'd been to the Crimean War, took to her bed with widespread pain. And we didn't change the name from widespread pain until the early 1900s, when a specialist announced at a conference that it would be fibrosi fibro fibrositis, beg your pardon, fibrositis. And we lived with fibrositis from the early 1900s until 1990, when the American College of Rheumatology met and decided to change the name and they changed it to fibromyalgia and they set a criteria involving tender points and various things like this and they then reset the criteria um, around about 200 and changed the diagnosis in the hope that more doctors would find it easier to diagnose. Well thanks for that Jean, it's, uh, it's, it's been a learning curve for me over the past uh few weeks learning about fibromyalgia um, it could it could so easily go unnoticed and it's not difficult to see why doctors have not diagnosed it correctly in the past but it's good to hear that uh, somebody from Sheffield Hallam is now taking it up and is, is doing some research into it and let's hope they can get enough funding to, to go into it properly and identify this condition correctly and then maybe we'll be on the road to finding a cure in actual fact, that is a sort of three-course um, research. Um, we only pay for the first one, which was all we could afford, which was in the 2000, 3000 mark. But I mean, real research, we're talking hundreds of thousands, a lot of money. Um, and so, of course, they move on then to the pharma pharmaceutical companies and to those sort of companies. And of course, the pharmaceutical companies would love to find a cure for it, so they, or something to ease the pain, so that they can sell the drugs at extortionate <laughs> prices. Uh, this, of course, what they do. But that's what drugs companies do, and that, then we have to live with that. May Thank I you. give you a telephone number? Yes, indeed. Yes. Um, and an email. Um, yes, by all means. You, you can email me at Jean J E A N N E Hambleton, or one word at me, M-E dot com. I can tell you about conference, helpline, fibromyalgia, whatever. I'll answer anything. Always pleased to talk to fibromyalgia. Or the telephone number is 01243 674 447. Well, thank you for coming in and thank you for giving us a, a greater insight into it and, and into uh, what's available for people to uh, to learn more about fibromyalgia. And I'm sure we'll see you again in the not too distant future when you can come in and, and update us on how it's all going. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jim. Bye now. And we go across to the kitchen now where we've got some tasty dishes for you. That's not including me, I have to say. And our first recipe for today is a Moroccan stew. Now, it's aromatic, it's spicy, it's lovely. It really is tasty, a real tasty dish. 
and this recipe will serve eight so if you get some friends coming around for all the sorts of wintry things that go on like bonfire night and stuff like that this is the ideal stuff to give them and what we need for this is 200 grams of poi lentils three bay leaves two whole garlic cloves three tablespoons of olive oil one teaspoon of chopped fresh thyme leaves one tablespoonful of minced garlic another tablespoonful of olive oil <laughs> one teaspoon of dried crushed red chili flakes one teaspoon of ground cinnamon one teaspoon of ground cumin one teaspoon of ground coriander one tablespoon of minced garlic we also require 150 grams of chopped onions 125 grams of chopped celery 125 grams of chopped courgette one red pepper also chopped one yellow pepper also chopped no surprise there then and one butternut squash peeled and that needs to be seeded and cut into two and a half centimeter cubes 400 grams tin of chopped tomatoes 400 gram tin of chickpeas drain them off and one liter of vegetable stock and 600 grams of fresh flat leaf parsley and now to garnish this up if you if you want to garnish it up you can get some natural yogurt, so about 125 grams of natural yogurt, two tablespoons full of chopped fresh mint, that's optional, but you know, it just adds a little something to it, and a quarter teaspoon of cayenne pepper, which is also optional. You, you don't have to garnish it if you don't want, but it just makes it look nice, and it just adds a little bit to the taste. And so, having got all that together, this is what we do. We fill a large pot with water and bring to the boil over a high heat, Stir in the lentils and the bay leaves and the whole garlic cloves and return to the boil. Then reduce the heat to low and simmer the lentils until they're cooked, but still firm, about 10 minutes. Drain well, place the lentils in a bowl, toss with the olive oil, the thyme and one tablespoonful of chopped garlic, and remove the bay leaves and the whole garlic cloves and set aside. Heat one tablespoonful of olive oil in a large pot over a medium heat. Stir in the chili flakes, the cinnamon, the cumin, the coriander, and cook until fragrant. Add the garlic, onion, celery, courgette, red and yellow peppers, and squash, and cook for three or four minutes. Mix in the lentils, tomatoes, chickpeas, and vegetable stock, and raise the heat to medium high until the stew just begins to boil. Then reduce the heat to low, and cover, and then simmer until the squash is tender, about 20 minutes. Give it a stir once or twice while it's doing it. Add the chopped parsley, ladle into serving bowls and garnish with a dollop of yoghurt, some chopped mint and a pinch of cayenne pepper. And I do love that term, garnish with a dollop of yoghurt. <laughs> You're trying to add something a little bit cosy to it, a dollop of yoghurt. Okay, and that's the, uh, that's the first recipe for this week, and that's Moroccan stew. And to follow up that, this also serves eight and they'll enjoy these after the Moroccan stew. I don't think they quite go together, but uh, there we go. This will be lovely for them. And that's blackberry and apple turnovers. It takes about half an hour to prepare, about 10 minutes to cook, and it's nice and easy to do. And for the ingredients, this is what we need. We need 640 grams of puff pastry, ready-made. You can make your own if you'd like to, but ready-made is just as easy. And for the filling, we want some cooking apples, or two large cooking apples, peeled and cubed into small chunks, 200 grams of blackberries, 50 grams of unrefined light muscovado sugar. Well, you can find that, you'll be all right. One teaspoonful of cinnamon, one tablespoonful of vanilla bean paste, and for the glaze, we need one egg beaten. So that's nice and easy, isn't it? Half the challenge of this will be finding the stuff to make it with. And this is what we do. In a large saucepan, place the chopped apples, blackberries, sugar, cinnamon and vanilla bean paste and heat and simmer for 5 to 10 minutes until the apples become soft. And remove from the heat and allow them to cool. Preheat the oven to 220 degrees centigrade. That's uh, 200 degrees centigrade on fan ovens and gas mark 7 otherwise. Roll out two sheets of the puff pastry onto a lightly floured surface and quarter forming four nice evenly sliced squares of pastry. Spoon a few tablespoonful of the fruit mixture into the centre of the square and then fold over to form a triangle. Crimp the seals with a fork to keep them 
keep the shape when baking and reduce the filling spilling out and with a knife create a few small vents in the top to allow the steam to be released otherwise they'll all pop open. A place on a baking tray lined with baking paper brush lightly with milk or beaten egg to glaze well we had the egg there to glaze earlier on and bake in the oven for 10 minutes or until golden brown and to serve these you just dust them with icing sugar or a drizzle of custard oh custard wonderful and that'll be ideal for a cold winter's evenings gathering well we have a piece of music now from a duo from the Bogdan Regis area called Small Talk and that's Jonathan Leahy and Emma Vickers and the song was written by Jonathan himself Last year I learned to cry again and it felt good Tears rolled down my face again Like I always knew they should Cause I'd battled and stopped for so long I'd become numb haven't flowed this way for me for so long way too long today I've turned to page and the past is over I finally feel myself again and I've forgotten what that's like Wonderful, amazing I'll bring tears to my eyes The fears that held me back for so long They've all gone now And I opened up my eyes wide today And I saw the world Sun, the rain, the clouds in the sky It's like Hollywood That I finally feel I can love again I guess I always could Open my heart to someone again It'll feel so good Makes me cry again Reach out Make me want to try again And feel the blood rushing through my veins Make my heart ache that way For someone again And it feels so good Feels so good. Yes, it feels so good. That's a lovely piece of music there from Small Talk that's written by Jonathan Leahy. We go across now to our old friend Ellis Berg. And Ellis is gonna regale us with a tale entitled Axody. I don't believe it. His eyes open with a click, or to be precise. To a click. I was watching that, he protested. Oh, not now, she said. What's more, you weren't anyway, unless you watched through your eyelids. He hated the way she stood, backs of her hands on hips, arms akimbo. Only worth that akimbo, he thought. I must look it up. Her voice faded away as he turned down the volume in his ears. I wonder if it's in Chambers. Old joke. Do you read Chambers? No, only teacups. The volume slowly turned up again. And I suppose you'll spend the rest of the week doing nothing while I do the rest. Lady Pig. She left the room mumbling. 
He switched on the programme again, hoping he'd be able to pick up the plot. Somehow he doubted it, he wasn't very good at following plots. Detective stories floored him completely, even Agatha Christie's. He mourned the passing of Benny Hill now. There was somebody he could follow, especially the chase at the end. He ran one in the video of his mind using short bursts of memory. He gave up the effort. The sight of Victor Meldrew buried up to his neck in his flower bed put Benny Hill out of his mind. He listened to the Edinburgh morning side accents of the husband and wife putting a neat end to the episode and waited for the next entertainment of the evening. He sat discontentedly, hoping for something to exercise his mind. An advertisement begged him to smoke a cigar, another beseeched him to keep his hands as soft in his face. He ran his hands over the two-day-old stubble and doubted if it would work. He thought about the next morning, when he'd be obliged to shave and wear fresh clothes for a job interview. She would see that he got up and left the house on time. He rehearsed his reasons for being turned down, anticipating her anger and arguments and probing questions and her assertions that he had done his best to make sure he didn't get the job. Now there she was definitely in the wrong. These people weren't fools. They could see perfectly well that he wouldn't be happy in charge of anything. No, not even a broom, I suppose. You could get a job as a street sweeping even when you couldn't manage the bends in the road. His mind continued to drift. The third part of a serial he hadn't been following, another detective thriller, was halfway through. Some character addressed another as commander and he wondered if he were in the Navy or the police. He tried to work out if they were equivalent ranks, and by the time he came to a decision, they weren't. The episode had finished and the advertisements had started again. I'm going to bed now, you can do as you like. Thank you, I shan't be long. He sat on the side of his bed trying to remember what it was like before she got rid of the double and bought twins. One shoe lay on its side, the other waited on the foot, resting across his thigh. He looked at the shoes and noticed he needed to give them a polish. Would they notice? He tried to imagine himself sitting in the chairman's position. Would he look at the applicant's feet? Yes, he bloody would. What was the old saying? Look after the extremities. That meant hands, hair and boots. Boots? Now, that must have been said a long time ago, and you can always tell a gentleman by his boots he'd read somewhere. Are you going to leave that sock on the floor, and isn't it time you had your shower? Always questions. The alarm clock radio suddenly pierced his ears. The six pips of the radio for news. A teacup rattled. He was getting tea in bed. Had it been the only one, that? Hurry up and get that tea down, you don't forget to shave and polish your shoes, and I've put your appointment details, so don't say, don't say I do nothing for you. And there's a good hot porridge on the table, and don't let it get cold. He sat gloomily in the bus, he had his hair, fair put in his hand, as he left the house in good time. She saw to that. The appointment letter was in his inside pocket and he knew the company office building well. It was easier to go than stay. The receptionist smiled at him. Now that was a bonus. He hadn't been smiled at by a young woman for how long? He could only remember an occasion when he stopped at a zebra crossing and a pretty girl. His wife had said, don't kid yourself, it's only because she thinks you're old and safe. It didn't happen again because his wife took over the driving. He wasn't sorry, he didn't like it anyway. The interview was a shock. 
Not only were there other applicants, they were all keen and eager, men and women, power-dressed and aggressive. Uh, come in, Mr. Blair. Come in, come in. Sit down and make yourself comfortable. Good journey. Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you for seeing me. He remembered the patter from he, when he used to do the interviewing in the dear dead days of long ago. Thank God he didn't have to do it anymore. The usual civil niceties were exchanged. The chairman, rather old for today's fashionable executives, fumbled with papers. Now, what do you know about our company? He'd known about the company for years. He knew what to say. Now, what we are looking for, the foreign control took over. He had no need to listen. He'd used all of it in his time. And you seem to have the experience we're looking for. However, we are obliged to interview the other candidates, and we'd be very glad if you would wait until the uh, procedures are finished. Uh, thank you. As the opposition, as he now mentally classed them, filed in and out, he began to wonder if he could do the work required. There were new regulations in place, new ways of addressing staff, new ways of being addressed, come to that, and for what? Just to buy materials, make a product, and sell it to the public who didn't know they wanted it until the participants told it they did. It felt the whole thing was utterly pointless. Why bother? The job was offered and he accepted it. It was easier than explaining why he didn't really want it. The chairman offered his hand and welcomed him aboard. He walked past the receptionist and out into the street. The stroke hit him while he was putting his key in the front door. His wife had heard the sound because she was nerving herself for what she feared would be a confrontation as she accused him of not trying and he denied it. There would be as usual half-truths and downright self-delusion and her noisy tears behind the firmly closed bedroom door, or so she had thought. This time, it was different. On the way to the hospital, she had a moment of gallows humour. You're going to get better, this was to her prostrate, unconscious husband. You're going to be fit and well, and then I'm going to kill you. His first impression on waking was that he was still in bed and the day had not yet begun. His second was that his wife was using a different plug-in house deodorant, one that smelt of hospitals. His third impression was that he was in hospital in bed and people in all sorts of untidy clothes were looking at him. A young woman in a blue frock said she was his nurse for the time being and would he like to see his wife. He tried to speak and only a sort of groan came forth. He thought, this is dream paralysis and I'll wake up soon. The nurse said, blink if you want to see her. He blinked. Why not, he thought. She sat by his bed, clutching and then waving a bag. It looked like a gift of grapes. I expect you know you're going to be here for a long time. The doctor says you've had quite a severe stroke, but you'll recover if you do all the things that... Her voice trailed away as if she knew he couldn't answer. More likely wouldn't, she thought. For once there was no arguing, nothing to argue about. She stood up, folded her arms, unfolded them, walked over to the window, looked out, turned round, and faced him again. Well, I can't stand around here all day. I'll be in again tomorrow. Days passed. Small gains shown in his movements. He began to speak well enough for experienced staff to understand him. Everything was done for him. He was completely content. The chaplain visited him and asked him if there was anything he wanted. 
While he was thinking, his wife came into the ward. Hello, Padre, she said. Nice to see you again. This was a new one. He had no idea that she and the chaplain had met. Does that mean he was worse than he had thought? I knew the Padre years ago, she said. He used to visit W.I. when I was a member. The two of them sat down companionably near the foot of the bed and conversed in low tones, quite ignoring their patient. Not that he cared. He found visiting times a strain. No, correction, he found them a bore. He had to be honest, he couldn't see the point of the aimless conversations with visitors. He noticed the padre and his wife glancing at him almost furtively. Well, we know what they're talking about, don't we? Us. That's who he... He listened. He heard the word sloth being used, then accident would be more precise, which is a pity. What did he mean? Accident is a pity. Good word, accident. He must look it up sometime. If he could be bothered. The Weather Report. And here's a look at the weather for the coming week. Well, Monday is going to be foggy. We're going to see some fog on Monday. 10% chance of rain. Temperatures around 15 degrees. Winds easterly at about 9 miles an hour, so not too bad at all. Tuesday, unfortunately, there's a 40% chance of rain. Temperatures remain the same at about 15 degrees and the wind picking up slightly to about 11 miles an hour and coming from the southeast. On Wednesday, much the same. 60% chance of rain. Temperature 14 degrees, wind picking up slightly again to 12 to 13 miles per hour. Thursday, 40% chance of rain, temperatures around 15 degrees and winds coming south-southwest at 11 miles per hour. Friday, 50% chance of rain, 15 degrees and winds picking up to 15 miles an hour again from south-southwest. And on Saturday, well, Saturday, there's only a 20% chance of rain, so maybe a shower or two. Sun coming out a little bit. Temperatures creeping up to 17 degrees, which is quite warm for this time of year. And wind speeds at about 14 miles an hour. And that's it for the coming week. And that just leaves me to thank the team of the researchers, Jill Barnes and Katrina Hayburn, and to producer John Fletcher. And this is Keith Barnes saying thank you for joining us, and uh, see you again soon. Bye-bye now.